Um, so this is going to be a little different than some of the other talks. Um, it's not focusing on specific technology. Um, what will happen is that you'll often use packages and tools, uh, but what's really important to do is understand what those tools are doing under the hood. Um, I'm going to show you an example of a really cool uh, kind of concept called hidden Markov models, and we're going to build it up from scratch. We're going to have a little bit of Python code to show that you can implement it in just a few lines. You wouldn't do that in practice, but uh, it's good to know that when you do like import HMM or something like that, what that's doing under the hood. Okay. A uh, little bit about myself. Um, so I work at LinkedIn right now. Uh, I graduated from UC Berkeley. Uh, at Berkeley, that's where I learned first about hidden Markov models. And actually what was happening was somebody um, I was helping somebody understand something called dynamic programming. I'll get to that. And they asked, what are some useful applications of that concept? And I found, I realized that what I learned at Berkeley, well, that was a great application of it. Okay. So what are the goals? Just want to set some expectations uh, so that nobody's disappointed. First of all, we're going to introduce this concept of hidden Markov models. Okay. We're going to use this concept of dynamic programming, which, like I said, I'll explain more about what exactly that is, uh, to see how we can use hidden Markov models to make predictions. Um, and then we'll do some overview of some places where uh, hidden Markov models are used in the real world. And that's where we'll talk a little bit about the training part of it. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into the training part of it because that's another, it's basically another talk. And I would love to um, deep dive into it some other time. Okay. Um, so let's start with a motiv motivating example. And by the way, all of this will build up on itself. So if there are questions, I would love to make sure they're clarified before moving on. Uh, but the motivation for this is going to be speech recognition, right? So you have this kind of waveform that's coming into you, and there's these chunks, and we want to map them to syllables. So dynamic, right? Uh, in a sense, we have our uh, things that we are taking in as input, the waveform, and our output, the actual syllables that represent what those waveforms mean, right? So the way we represent that as a hidden Markov model is as follows. We start with things called states. States are the ground truth, OK? So in this case, it would be like dynamic, right? Uh, they form this chain, OK? Uh, we'll get into some properties of these that are really important for how we use this. But these are called hidden states. And the reason they're called hidden states is because for each of those states that you're in, you're going to emit some kind of observation, OK? So for the first uh, syllable, die, there could be many different observations that we could see. Different people will talk about, uh, spell out that syllable in different ways. Um, and there's some kind of probability. So basically, there's a whole set of different waveforms we might look at. Some of those are likely to be uh, emitted from die, some from na, some from mic. Uh, but uh, all of those have probabilities of being emitted from each of those states. And we only observe the, the actual observations. The states that are underlying them are hidden. We don't know what they are. Okay. Some properties of this hidden Markov model. We start off with what's known as an initial probability. So that says that what is the probability of getting into a particular state from the get-go, OK? So way we would think about this for the speech recognition uh, example is, what are people likely to start off by saying, right? So not all syllables are as likely to start off a chunk of text or chunk of speech, let's say. There's also transition probabilities. So going from one state to another. So going from die to na, there is some probability of doing that. But going from two completely unrelated syllables that never show up in English next to each other, very low probability, you know, close to zero. 
and there is such a probability for every pair of states. And what's important here, you notice, is that the boxes for the transition probabilities are on individual arrows. So the real important property that makes these Markov models is that the transition from one state to another only depends on the starting state and where you end up. It does not depend on the entire history. That is a limitation. Um, there are, for example, generalizations where you might look at the last two or three states, but generally it doesn't turn out to be that big of a problem, and it simplifies our problem a lot. Okay. And finally, the last parameter of our hidden Markov model is the emission probability. So again, given a particular syllable, what is the what probability do you have of emitting a particular waveform? Okay, and that exists for every pair of, of uh, state and emission. Okay. Are there any questions on this? Okay. So these are the parameters of our HMM, uh, and here's the problem that we want to solve. So we have some kind of HMM with these three parameters. And we have a sequence of emissions. So in this case, a bunch of waveforms, like chunks of waveforms, one after the other. And what we want to calculate is what is the most probable sequence of hidden states that resulted in those emissions. So what was the ground truth? Um, there could be multiple ground truths for a particular set of waveforms, but what is the most probable one, right? Well, that's the fundamental thing we want to solve for. Why is this a hard problem at all? Well, let's take a look. So maybe we're inferring some syllables. And where we are is ah, OK? Tur. OK, that's what it sounds like. Great. And keep going. Mo, Bill. OK. The problem is we thought, based on maybe the way somebody was talking, the first two syllables were otter. But really, it was auto, right? And we didn't know that until we got later in the sequence. So somehow we have to predict into the future what's going to be the actual uh, waveforms that are going to come up later. And if you think about that, how are we going to predict the future? So that's why this is a non-trivial problem. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at it a little differently, right? So right now, the problem was in the kind of where the critical junction was, where we had to make the choice. We were inferring a bunch of syllables, and then we had to make a decision. Are we going into a as in O, or a as in AU? And we don't know until later which one was the right choice, but somehow we've kind of let ourselves be um, put into a particular path without knowing how this path will affect us later, right? We're going to flip it now. We're going to say, let's look at every possible state uh, or sequence of ground truths we could have had. And then later, when we have more information, choose one of those to continue. Okay. So now we're not saying, here's the best path I have so far. How do I continue forward? It's, I have all these paths from before. Which one do I continue, right? It's a little abstract, but framing it in this way will help us uh, formulate an actual uh, uh, algorithm for solving this problem. So what we're going to do to make this concrete is define this, this um, function, right, v. And the reason this is called v is because this is the Viterbi algorithm, OK? And it says that at time t, what if we ended up at state x? What's the probability of that? We could have taken any path. It doesn't matter what path we took to get to that point. So that's, for example, saying, what's the probability of ending up at ter versus toe, right? Um, so that's the basic idea. Uh, if it's a little abstract, let's define how we would actually calculate this, and it'll make more sense. So if we want to talk about the very first time step, right? we, we want to say, what if we ended up at state s? 
and we had y as our emission. Well, what's the probability of that happening? We need two things to happen. First, we need to have ended up in state s in the first place, and that's defined by our initial probability. And we needed to have emitted y from state s. And again, because of the Markov property and generally about HMMs, uh, the emission probability was not dependent on how we got there. So these are independent. We multiply them together. So this is for t equals 0. For any given uh, st ending state at the first time step. Okay. Any questions with this part? Now, what if we're in the middle of our sequence, right? Some arbitrary time t. Well, first of all, we could have come from a bunch of other previous steps. It doesn't matter how we got to those steps, but we were at some uh, step r at time t minus 1. And we need to know what was the probability of getting to that r okay, at that time step. Then we needed to transition from r into s. Doesn't matter how we got to R, but going from R to S is one of the transition probabilities, right? And we want the maximum probability, right? So we look at all the possible previous states and maximize this quantity over that, okay? And finally, we still need to emit Y from that last step, okay? Does that make sense to people? So that just gives us, this is just summarizing what I said, right? So you have something for t equals 0 and for any arbitrary t after 0. There's a couple of things that we should notice about this. Well, first of all, the inputs are basically integers. Now, granted, the second input is really a state, but there's a finite number of them. You can assign a num uh, an integer to them, so they're 0 through some, some number, right? Um, and then the time steps are also discrete. Secondly, uh, the, the function depends on itself. It's a recursive one, so it's called a recurrence relation. Okay. Now, if we were to just try to evaluate this, what we'll see is that we would end up calculating the same things again and again. Right? We might, uh, if we go back to something like this, right? what r are we coming from? It doesn't matter what s we're going to. We would have to look at the same r's again and again and again. And that would just be a waste of computation time. So that's where the fact that our, our inputs are integers really comes in handy. We can lay out all the different values for t in this kind of table. And that says that on one axis, we have the time steps. On one axis, the different states, OK? So this is just a two-dimensional table. We just need to fill this out. And we can fill it out in kind of a smart order. Okay. So we know that at time t equals 0, there's no dependencies. right? We, don't, we can calculate those without needing any other values prior to it. We just need to know the HMM parameters. Right. Any questions about that? Then for one of the next, uh, one of the elements in the next time step, right, we need to look at all the previous states. So we're going to depend on all the previous states, but that's okay. We just co computed everything on the previous time step. And that's the basic idea. You're just going to go through column by column filling out this table. Okay. Um, this will give you all the values of v. Now, can anybody tell me how much of this table we need to keep in memory at a time? Any ideas? What about the columns? One column, right? So you compute one column, the first column. Then you use that to compute the next column. And then you can throw away the first column. And then you compute the next column. Unfortunately, the real world isn't that nice because we have to do one more thing, right? At the end, what you'll have is these v values. What are the v values again? They're probabilities. What was the probability that you ended at a particular step at the very end, right? And that's great. You could take the maximum such probability, but you still need to figure out what states got you to that probability, right? So we're going to store some 
pointers back to when we did that maximization step that said, here are some R's we're looking at, what R led to this highest probability, we're going to keep a, a little reference saying, oh, we came from this R in order to get this highest probability. And so for that reason, we do have to keep the entire table in memory. That's a great question. So the question is, like, why can't we just keep track of just the linked list that results in the highest probability? Right? The problem is, until you get to the very end, you don't know what's your last, what's the maximum in the very last column. So there is multiple paths through this table. And there's multiple linked lists through this table. And you're only going to pick out one of them. But you don't know that until you get to the very end. Does that make sense? Um, just imagine, right, like the top right cell pointed to, pointed through a different path through this table, right? Uh, and that ended up being the very maximum probability. That would be a different path, but you wouldn't know that until the very end. Um, we can also talk about this later. Um, one thing I want to point out, we started with a mathematical definition. We visualized it graphically, and then that told us about how to proceed so we can do this most efficiently, right? Um, they told us which order we need to compute results so that those results are ready for us when we go to the next step. And that is dynamic programming, okay? So anytime you have this kind of recurrence relationship where the inputs are integers, lay them out in a table, in a line, whatever, some grid, and that should give you some insight into what order you should be solving these problems. There's more to this, uh, more benefits to this approach because let's think about what the, the performance characteristics of this are. So we said we need to keep around this whole table, okay? So how many entries is that? Well, if there's t time steps and s states, it's just t times s, right? We can just read it off this table directly. That would be hard to do from that mathematical definition we had earlier. Secondly, what is the time complexity? Well, again, s times t, that's how many cells we need to compute. And then as we saw here, for most of the cells, we need to depend on s previous cells. So s times t times s. So to summarize that, right, the space complexity, s times t, time complexity, s squared times t, right? Um, any questions on this? The idea was we just read this off the table. Again, visualizing dynamic programming is what helps you kind of gain these kinds of insights. So just, I'm going to go through a little bit of code, um, but again, the, it's really a translation of what I've already said. Uh, we might represent our HMM with the three parameters, right? Um, and we need to have maps that say like, okay, given this state, what is the probability of entering that state and so on. We need to have that uh, representation and I'm just going to keep around the actual set of states that are possible uh, just so that they're easy to iterate over. And then we're going to keep around this concept of what is a probability of ending up at some end state, right? That's our V value, right? Uh, which we here call P for probability. And then what is the previous state that led to that point? And for the very first column of our table, that's just none. But for every, all the other col uh, columns, we're going to have some entry here, right? So we've got to keep around two pieces of information. I'm going to just start off calculating that first column. Um, you don't have to read through all of this, but it is literally a translation of that, that equation, right? But we're just doing it over a bunch of states. Um, we're going to now go through the rest of the time steps, starting at 1 all the way to the end. 
we're going to go through the possible states. Those are the previous one. Uh, no, these are the ending states. And we're going to look at all the previous states. And this is, notice we're referring to that v, um, uh, those v values that we looked at before. And we're just storing that value along with the previous pointer. Okay. Um, I don't want you to have to memorize this. I, once I thought through this, uh, this procedure, it wasn't that difficult to actually put it down as code because the table was there and you just like think, how do I iterate through a table? Finally, at the end, you look at the very last time step and look at the ending probability, that's the highest, and that's your best end state. And to recover the path, now you're just gonna follow this linked list, right? Go back to the previous state, go back to the previous state, and so on. Of course, you should reverse it so you get the order you care about, right? So let's look at a couple of uh, real world examples. We talked about speech recognition, but let's dive into that a little more. I said that there are states that are predefined and observations that are predefined. How do you really have this kind of continuous thing that's a waveform and how do you make those into discrete observations that you can kind of have in a table of some sort? Well, the answer is you look at something like a 25 millisecond window and you do some kind of like, you know, uh, transformation that pulls out the, the frequencies. You also, this is where you have to put in the information you have about your problem domain. That's really important. Here, another thing that this paper talks about is taking those frequencies and uh, mapping them to what our ears would actually hear and then taking the top ones so that we're really extracting the most important piece of information. So this is basically feature extraction, right? And that gives us uh, maybe a 10-dimensional vector or something, and that's our observation space. And we do this, it actually, uh, the paper talks about doing it every 10 milliseconds, um, and so there's some overlap and so on, um, but that's the basic idea here, okay. Um, another one, biology, computational biology, this is where I actually first encountered this. Um, what you have is in DNA, you have these four, um, kind of bases, nucleotides, right? A, T, C, and G. Uh, and that is your thing that you're observing, right? It's one of those four things. Now, it turns out that in a DNA sequence, not every part of that sequence really codes for the proteins, right? Or the amino acids that make up those proteins. So there's parts called exons that actually do something and introns that don't do anything. And we need to figure out where those uh, regions are, right? And it turns out, again, build, bringing in some information from uh, the domain is useful because the probability of seeing certain types of sequences of these nucleotides is different between the different, um, different regions. And also, the nucleotides in the coding regions, the regions that actually produce amino acids, they will come in triplets. They have to be like, a particular sequence of three nucleotides, one after the other, um, that code for an amino acid. So in our case, our ground truth are these three uh, exon states, right? They have to be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and so on. And then the int uh, intron states, right? And then that, we just use that to infer the exon and intron regions, and again, we needed to know what was our probability of, of seeing certain types of nucleotides in certain regions. Okay. Uh, the last one I want to talk about is facial recognition. Um, this one was an interesting one where you start with these images and you take out little, you talk about the regions in the images, right? So if you're looking at a face, well, first you'll see like a forehead, eyes, nose, mouth, and so on. And you need to see them in that order. And different parts of the images, different pixel values that you'll see will map more, uh, more frequently to 
forehead. You can kind of imagine that maybe a forehead is more sparse, right? Um, so, and you do need them to be in that order for it to be a face. So let's try inferring it. Well, what is our, our features and what is our ground truth? Well, features, we look at this image, we take out a particular slice of the image, and we do this thing called the KLT. It's a type of transformation in uh, image processing uh, that kind of tells us a little bit about how the pixels are distributed. Um, and what it turns out is you take the top number of those, right? And there's different distributions of those, those K values that you get after the transform depending on the different regions. So here maybe eyes, it looks something like this in the graph that you see versus in the mouth region, it looks very different, right? So again, just like in the uh, speech recognition example, you might have something like, I don't know, ten, a 10 dimensional vector as your observation space. And then your ground truth here is just the forehead, nose, mouth, et cetera. OK? Any questions about that? Just a quick overview. Um, speech recognition is definitely one of the places where it's like highly, highly used. Um, uh, but these are, and biological uh, applications are also, they also use HMs quite a bit. Uh, I don't know how much facial detection still uses HMMs, but this was a cool application that caught my eye. Okay, so that's all assuming we have an HMM and we know those probabilities, right? So we assumed kind of we know what is our initial probabilities, our transition probabilities, and our emission probabilities. But what if we don't, all right? Um, how do we train it? So given a set of emissions, we want to find the HMM parameters that maximizes the probability of getting those, those emissions, okay? And we'll talk about how we incorporate multiple sequences of emissions later, but that's the basic problem that's being solved here. And like I said, I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail, um, but I do want to briefly introduce the concept Right, so there is an algorithm that starts with the following. We will initialize the parameters either completely randomly or if we can, we will find, use some prior knowledge, right? So in the case of speech recognition, like I said, one piece of prior knowledge would be what is the distribution of words in the English language? That will help you figure out your initial probabilities and your transition probabilities. Next, there is this uh, expectation step. And so just like we did the Viterbi algorithm to find out the most probable path up to a certain point, we will actually do something very similar uh, to find probabilities that end in a particular subsequence. And these are known as our forward and backward probabilities. And we'll combine them in some way to figure out kind of what is the probability of emitting something from a particular state at a given time. And there are some equations um, that I don't want to get into, but we will update our parameters based on this, right? That's called our maximization step. And we just keep repeating that process until we've not, we're not seeing any more improvements. This is known as an expectation maximization algorithm. And in particular, for hidden Markov models, the particular algorithm is called Baum-Welch. That's what incorporates the, um, the forward and prior, um, uh, prior probabilities. It does have problems with local minima. So that's why you want to make sure that if you can, initialize your, prob uh, initialize your, your parameters as best as you can early on to guide it towards the right solution. And then there are some generalizations that you need to do in which you incorporate multiple sequences. Um, and you would do that kind of at the expectation stage. Um, so you're not basically taking one HMM, training it on one sequence, overfitting to that sequence, and then training it on a new one, uh, wiping out your work from the previous one. So uh, there are some, there's a paper from, I think, like 1986 that talks about that uh, whole process.
Hi, uh, thanks for the good talk. Um, so you mentioned a couple times that it is important that the HMM parameters were integers. Can you elaborate on those? Sure. Um, so I'm not talking about the parameters of the HMM, the initial probabilities and things like that. I'm talking about, let's see. Yeah, these parameters into this, uh, this recurrence relationship, right? We want to define something that we'll, where we will calculate values at particular time steps and for particular states, and that's what allows us to create this kind of table that we can fill out. Uh, yeah, and also I have another short question is, um, uh, so uh, for, for fitting the HMM, mm -hmm. you would uh, have to give it a parameter as in how many state you want to find, right? So can you like make it non-parametric as in like can the model, can the algorithm find the optimal number of states? Yeah, so in this case, um, through the algorithms I talked about, I don't know if there's other ones, but um, there is an assumption that you've already modeled your problem with some states and observations. Um, ahead of time, yes. Does it have to be equally spaced in time? Um, technically, no. There is no requirement for that. Uh, however, once you think about it in terms of an HMM, um, you've converted from your domain-specific uh, like representation into the HMM representation. They are discrete time steps, so it's one after the other. There's no constant of like, it came after this many milliseconds or something like that. Um, so, for example, with the speech recognition, right, yes, we're taking every tw uh, 10 milliseconds, we're taking a sample, right? Even if you didn't take it every 10 milliseconds, probably wouldn't work as well, but it's still state time step 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. In, in, uh, independently of the, of the lag or, or uh, mm -hmm. spacing between the time steps. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't bring in the... Um, at least not in these examples, you're not bringing in any concept of the timing information okay. yeah, into this model. Understood. Thank you. Yep. So I'm pretty sure I'm missing something, mm -hmm. but if all your states are predefined mm -hmm. and all your probabilities are predefined and the times are defined, how are you iterating? What are you, because I mean, you compute once and you already have your maximum. Right. Right. So this is where we get into this uh, problem right here, right? Uh -huh. Is if you were just to go forward, right, one by one, you would have to have information about what the, uh, what's coming later to determine what is your best pick at this point, right? Because of like the way somebody was talking, it might have made sense probabilistically to pick auteur, uh -huh. not auto. Yeah. But you don't know that until the end. Right. Yeah. But you have all the states at step three, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. if I go through the table once, I still like get to the same maximum at at like o termo, right? So I have state zero being yeah. the o and the state two being the turn yeah know. but that's not what you wanted you wanted automobile that was a better choice yeah. in this case right so you picked the wrong ones when you went through that sequence once so you would kind of have to go through the sequence multiple times incorporate information about what's coming up later to pick the right choices earlier on okay does that make sense or no, because I feel like you're going through all the chains anyway. You're uh -huh. going through every iteration with every possibility going through the table uh -huh. once. Yeah, so the way we're going through this table assumes we've already framed the problem in that like backwards way, right? If we were framing it in the forwards way, the arrows would all point in the opposite direction, right? Um, and you could do that, right? But the important thing is you just have to make sure that you are not, uh, you're not repeating the same calculations again and again. So when we talk about all possible chains, well, the first time step, it could be any of those states. Then the next one, any of those states. So this is like a combinatorial explosion, right, of possible chains that we could have. And you can't explore all of them. You can't iterate over every possible chain, 
right? So how do you make it so that you are somehow incorporating all that information, but only filling out this table once? So two questions. One, you're building up the table to do iteration rather than recursion, correct? Yeah. it's So that it's mm -hmm. um, better on memory and it doesn't affect the call stack or something like yeah. that. Okay. Sure. And related to the previous question, if you're trying to predict more, mm -hmm. you're building up the table once. But sure. if you're trying to predict like the last part, Mm -hmm. um, automobile, the meal part, yeah. are you redoing the table or are you using the entire table which you have until now? Yeah, uh, you would definitely, like if you're talking about one sequence that you're predicting, then definitely you you will just just keep filling out the table left to right, right? You won't, that's the entire point of not reusing that work. Now, if you're doing speech recognition and you're hearing a new sample, these are all completely new uh, observations. So you're going to have to fill out a different, um, a different table because now you're seeing different observations, right? This is this table. It has states and time as parameters, but not the uh, the observation. And so this table is for a specific set of observations. Okay. Um, I just want to point out one thing related to that first question about converting recursion into iteration. Um, there is a related technique called memoization. So what you do is you treat it like regular recursion, but every time you calculate some value for some inputs, you save it in some, some map or something. And in certain cases where you could throw away some of that information, like we said, if we didn't care about those back pointers, then we could throw away any column we're done with, right? In that case, it would be more memory efficient to go through this iteration approach. Uh, how would you define initial state probabilities for like some of your other examples, like image recognition mm -hmm. or like coding regions in, an, in, in a DNA sequence? Sure, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know all of the domain specific, uh, I don't have that domain specific knowledge, um, but if you've observed in your data that let's say you do know some of your uh, data from before, then you can use that to help you figure out what's, uh, or, or for example, if you know in the biological sequences that like you have these types of amino acids near the beginning of the chain, right? That could help you figure out, okay, this is how we usually start off with these types of states. Like it's usually an intron or exon state. So um, how many previous steps do we take into account with this? Um, so in terms of the actual mechanism of computing things, we're only looking at the previous step, right? So one step. However, when we look at the previous step, we're using the values we've computed up to this point. So in a sense, we are taking into account the entire path we might have come through to get to that point. And that's how we get around that idea of like, looking into the future or looking into the past, we're capturing and summarizing a lot of information about, about the past. Um, so does that mean, let's say, for one syllable, I want to take into account previous two syllables, mm -hmm. then it is like two times two, four, four possible previous yes. steps. It Right, exactly. So as you add more previous steps that you depend on, uh -huh. um, this does increase the time complexity significantly exponentially. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, Avik, that was a fantastic talk. Can we give him a round of applause?